my first introduction to zombies was I was about 12 or 13, and I was watching, I think it was either HBO or Showtime. There was only two cable channels back in 1985. And when you're a teenager, there's only one reason to watch cable TV. Uh, my parents were out to dinner. I was in their room. Uh, I used to stay up all night just hoping, praying, that for some reason in some movie some girl would take her shirt off. And suddenly I flipped over and there was a young, well, she wasn't young, she must have been older than me, a beautiful woman, half naked, walking through some native village in some jungle environment. And I thought, just praise Allah. I was so happy. And then zombies came out of the darkness and started eating people. And I didn't know this, but I had stumbled into an Italian cannibal zombie movie. I'm pretty sure, I'm 99% sure that the director, the producers, mixed in actual cannibal footage because it took place on New Guinea. And I'm pretty sure they took documentary footage of real cannibalism and put it in the movie. So when you're 13 and you're going through puberty and the biggest crisis in your life is hair growing in weird places and suddenly you're confronted with flesh being eaten, that stays with you. Now, when you wrote The Zombie Survival Guide, what was it that you felt you were doing in writing that? I wrote Zombie Survival Guide for me. I was always scared of zombies, and when Y2K started happening, when there was the Y2K fear, when all these survival guides were hitting the shelves, I thought there might be one that hit my phobia. So I went looking for a zombie survival guide, and nobody had written it. So I wrote it for me. I, I wrote it as an exercise and worked on it maybe an hour, maybe two every night when I was done trying to become a real writer. And I stuck it in a drawer. And a few years later, I met a book agent, and he said, oh, you've got this manuscript, and I love it, and I'm going to get you bidding more. And I said, you do that. And he did. And the moral of the story is don't ever town challenge Tom Wolfe's agent. Now, the book ended up being put in the humor section. Yeah. So was that something that bothered you, and was that... was <sighs> that your intention? I never intended the book to be in the humor section. I said this to Random House. I said, I'm not as cool as you think I am. You think that I'm some Saturday Night Live, uh, witty, zeitgeist-finding, finger-on-the-pulse kind of dude. That's not me. I'm a genuine dork. Uh, I'm into zombies. I've spent a lot of my time wondering how I would really survive them. And that's pretty much it. And they didn't want to hear it. They had marketing people who thought, well, you know, he's Mel Brooks' son, number one. Duh. So therefore, he must be what his father is. And number two, he wrote for Saturday Night Live. And three, he won an Emmy on Saturday Night Live. But forgetting, of course, that me winning an Emmy on SNL is kind of like my dad saying he won World War II. I happened to be on the team when we won. So they had their idea, and they put it in the humor section. And I've been paying for it ever since. Now, you really actually like research it. You're, you said you're a history nut, so what kind of research did you do to find the information that you wanted to include in that yeah, book? Everything, everything in that book is real. If you took the zombies out, it actually would be a disaster preparedness manual. There's nothing sort of zombie specific. Uh, everything I learned, I learned from either real survival books or actual life experience. I grew up in Southern California. We've all been prepared for earthquakes. Uh, for example, we all know that when there's an earthquake, you fill up the bathtub with water because you never know when the water's going to go out. Um, I learned about things like breaking your hiking boots before you hike from ROTC. Uh, I've done a, not a lot of camping, but enough to know what not to do. And I know enough disaster preparedness to know what not to do. So that was my compass for the guy. There was nothing in there that was meant to be sort of cute and witty and funny. And then what eventually led to doing World War Z? I wanted to write another zombie book after Zombie Survival Guide, but I didn't want to do another zombie adventure because that's what everybody has done. From the days of George Romero, every zombie story that I'd ever come across in any medium always dealt with uh, a guy or a group of people and they got to get from point A to point B and all the adventures they have along the way. But for me, zombies are big. They're a macro threat. There's no safe place. It's a global crisis. And so I had all these questions whenever I would see one of these little micro-adventures. I'd say, well, what is the government doing? And what are other countries doing? And 
how would you actually fight a war like this? And so nobody was answering all of my questions. So I just wanted to write it myself. And that's where it came from. And one of the things about World War Z that I think is so good is that if you're somebody who thinks they don't like zombie movies or they mm. don't like, you know, the whole fascination <clears throat> with zombies, um, it's really a book that's about so much more than that. Um, so kind of describe what it is that it tackles because it, the zombies are really kind of just the catalyst or the, the the blank slate that you kind of set your story on. Well, I think zombies are a great tool for exploring societal collapse, and I really wanted to explore that. I think the world has become so interconnected uh, that all you have to do is pull a few of these threads, and the whole tapestry unwinds. And so I, I wanted to explore that. I wanted to explore what would happen when the global supply chain is cut. How do you feed? a hundred million people. Uh, what happens when communication breaks down between two countries that have nuclear weapons? Um, what happens when the military sets up to fight one kind of war and is suddenly confronted with another? Uh, so there was a lot of issues I wanted to tackle and I thought zombies are a great way of doing that. Well it seems like the best zombie films are the ones that use the zombies kind of as a tool for social commentary. <clears throat> George Romero basically started the modern zombie genre. And he always infused his movies with social commentary. Uh, my favorite zombie movie of all time is the original Dawn of the Dead, which is just a seething indictment of the baby boomers. I mean, it really does chronicle what happens when a whole generation who won't trust anyone over 30 suddenly becomes 30. And how they just reject all their ideals for consumerism, capitalism, and they have built this society of greed that we now live in. And I think the original Dawn of the Dead should be sold next to Easy Rider. And it should be called The Baby Boomers, The Beginning and the End. And what are some of your other, like, can you name two other favorite zombie films? I love Shaun of the Dead. Uh, and I don't just say this because I've recently become friends with Simon Pegg. Who, by the way, is a legitimate zombie fan. We end up sitting next to each other at dinner and... He's really into it. He didn't just do it because it would be cute and funny. Like, he's done his homework, and he is a zombie fan. I loved it because it's a real movie. If you take the zombies out, it's the closest, I think, to defining that generation of English people as Clerks was to defining mine. I think it really did nail it. And I think that's probably the closest to a George Romero movie as anything we've had. I think they said they were originally going to call it Tea Time for the Dead. <laughs> Would have been perfect. <laughs> kind of play off of that. Um, can you talk about the fact that um, you did a really, they did a really nice audio book of uh, World War Z. And we're not it done. Was, it was abridged. So what, what's um, up with that at this point? Uh, Random House has finally given the go-ahead to do an unabridged audio book, uh, which I've been pushing them to do f for years. Uh, people have been coming up to me every time I do a convention. They say, oh, man, I, I love the audio book but it's abridged. All these great stories have been taken out. Uh, so thank God Random House has finally given us the go-ahead and we've been casting and it's been amazing. Um, and I can't talk about who we've nailed so far. I talk about a few of them. You know, like Henry Rollins has come back and he's sort of, he's recorded his goodbye. We got Bruce Boxleitner. We got Denise Crosby. Uh, we are going to have, well, Ah, uh, I, can't, I can't talk about them all, but, uh, but it is going to be. The unabridged audiobook is going to have a cast so big and so rich that it's going to make Irwin Allen smile from the grave. And when's that going to be out? That's going to come out in the spring. Wait a little bit. Yeah, yeah. No, you go, I mean, my goal was to, was to hire actors who I thought would obviously do the best job they could, but some that would come from the science fiction field and some that would uh, legitimately be, well, that would stick out in my mind. Uh, an example of a, a great science fiction actor would be someone like Bruce Boxleitner, who I met at a convention. He came up to me and he said, oh, hi, uh, I'd, love, uh, I'd love a copy of World War Z for my son. You, it's almost, and I turned into that Chris Farley character. Um, remember when in Tron is Babylon 5, you're awesome. That's pretty much me. And then you've got uh, people like F. Murray Abraham, who when I was a kid read Red Storm Rising, and that was a game changer for me. I'm very dyslexic. I couldn't read for pleasure. 
So I had to depend on audiobooks. So audiobooks for me are very important. And when it came time to do World War Z as an audiobook, I said, please, let me, let me get a real all-star cast. Let's do a radio drama like they used to do in the 1930s. Let's really make this something to be proud of. So I think it will be. And talk a little bit about why you think zombies have become so popular in our pop culture. I mean, at Comic-Con, we have you know The Walking Dead chase at Petco Park, and there's going to be a zombie <laughs> protest march um, coming down from Fourth Avenue uh, protesting for zombie rights. Uh, what do you think is fascinating people about it? Is it our particular time, or is it a cycle? I think that the zombie craze is very tied to the times we're living in. The last time you had a zombie craze was the 1970s, and that was, that was a time of anxiety. That was a time when people really did feel like the system was breaking down. Politically, economically, socially, even environmentally, there really was this feeling that it's not working anymore. And people were really scared. And they wanted to explore their apocalyptic fears, but they didn't want it to be too real. If you do a movie about nuclear war, which can really happen, good luck getting people to watch it. I remember when I was a kid and they had the day after, and they literally sent notes out to the kids saying, hey, parents, don't let your kids watch this. But when you do a zombie movie or a zombie book or a comic or whatever, you can have those same apocalyptic fantasies. Society breaking down, government disintegrating, people turning on each other. But if the catalyst is fictional, if it's a zombie, then you can still sleep at night. Uh, I think we're living in very uncertain times right now. It really is. I think there's such anxiety. And we keep getting slammed. And so much of the problem seems so big and we feel so powerless. Who knows what a credit default swap is? I don't. Guess what, neither do the people who invented it. But I do know it's responsible for millions and millions of people being thrown out of their homes. You can't shoot a credit default swap in the face. You can do that with a zombie. So a zombie allows us to see the end of the world, but because it's fake, it lets us sleep at night. I do think the appeal is too because they're not exactly monsters in the sense of um, like a werewolf or a, an alien creature because they look kind of like us. And, yeah. and there are instances, and some of the films that are the best um, are the ones where they are someone you actually know and loved at some point. So it's not that complicated. Well, I think one of the things that's so scary about zombie movies, certainly what appealed to me, is that you don't have to go looking for trouble. Trouble comes looking for you. And I think that's the times we're living in. I think most people are minding their own business and suddenly they're just getting hit with one crisis after another. Uh, people lived in New York, minding their own business, suddenly wake up to 9-11. People in New Orleans wake up to Hurricane Katrina. Uh, people all around the country woke up to being thrown out of their homes. I mean, it's just one crisis after another that we had nothing to do with. And that's the thing about zombies. You know, if you have a vampire or a werewolf or some other monster, chances are in that story, you have to go find them. You know, if there's a giant shark in the water, don't go in the water. Now, if millions of sharks suddenly start walking out of the water and killing us, that's a problem. And that's what's so scary about zombies. And I think that's uniquely American. I think there's a very American attitude of you don't bother them, they don't bother you. The rest of the world doesn't feel that. They know what it's like to be messed with. But I think we really have a sense of fairness. And I think zombies break the rule of fairness, which is like, well, wait a minute. I didn't raise you from the dead. I'm just hanging out. I'm doing my thing. I'm watching Family Guy. It's a ha, non sequitur. Ha, ha. And suddenly they're coming through the window. I think that's what's so scary about them.